Uh, I had at uh, Penn State University the Open Design Lab. Uh, and so uh, we do research into design in general and designing uh, things for people in particular. Uh, and have a lot of different uh, fun projects. We work on everything from cars and trucks and airplanes to medical devices uh, to environments. Uh, and we do a lot of work with global populations. Uh, so I spend time, uh, actually a fair amount of time now, traveling. Uh, I'm in Singapore every year uh, and teach a class on international product development there. And so we're engaged in those kinds of things. Uh, one of my other responsibilities at Penn State is I head what is called the Learning Factory. Uh, and the learning factory is two things. Uh, it's a physical space, it's a maker space uh, on campus. So if you are a young uh, engineer and you've got this great idea for something you wanna make for your girlfriend or for your motorcycle or to start a company or whatever, you can come to my shop, my maker space, and we will train you uh, on whatever equipment skills you need uh, and we'll provide you resources uh, to uh, whatever material access you need or anything else uh, to make the thing you want to make. That's the first aspect of the Learning Factory. And the second is we are the organization that manages all of the senior design projects for the College of Engineering. Uh, and so we have, uh, we run roughly 230 projects we'll run this year, so client-sponsored design projects. Uh, we have two of these big showcase events each year. Uh, this happens in uh, our basketball arena and they've pushed back the lower level of stands. Uh, there are 200 uh, sponsored projects, there are client uh, projects on display here. And we do that twice a year, so uh, I run that organization. As Matt Reed said, uh, I am a uh, University of Michigan alum. And so uh, this is a whiteout football game at, uh, at Penn State. So uh, I like to point out that uh, Penn State has the second largest football stadium in the country. Uh, the first being Michigan's. Uh, and uh, one of the things that they do is they have what they call the whiteout, uh, and everybody wears a white shirt. And then there's my wife and I right there. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we are still uh, Michigan fans, uh, except in volleyball, unfortunately. We're, uh, we're Penn State fans in volleyball and go to all those. But otherwise, uh, we, we still represent and do a nice job with that, I think. Uh, because we're going to be uh, spending some time together, and I'm hoping that you'll share a little bit with me, I'm going to share a little bit with you. Uh, I have a wife and four kids. They've gotten old, uh, and I have a dog. Her name is Ginny. Uh, I like to make stuff, uh, including furniture. So this is uh, the front room for our house, and uh, I made all our furniture uh, that's in there. So. This is a little Ray and Charles Eames going on with these things. This is a little Frank Lloyd Wright going on with that. Uh, I'm not good enough to come up with my own ideas. I do a lot of stealing. Uh, and Picasso said that was fine. Uh, and so, uh, so that's how we roll. Uh, I mentioned that those uh, kind of bench things, those couches, were in the style of Ray and Charles Eames. Uh, they are my design icons, uh, if you will. Uh, I think that uh, they are fantastic. They were a husband-wife design team. They're responsible for a lot of the look of the 20th century, and I think they did a lot of neat things. Uh, this is the home that they built, uh, that they designed and built in uh, Southern California, and uh, so when we visited that, I thought it was cool. Uh, but I want to talk to you for a moment about this guy. His name was Claude Levi Strauss. Uh, he's not the inventor of blue jeans. Uh, he's a different guy. Has anybody heard of this guy? Okay, so a couple, what do you remember? Anything or just the name? Just the name, there's another hand over here, just the name. So he's a French anthropologist uh, and came up with a whole bunch of really important anthropological things that I don't know anything about. Uh, but he did write a book called The Savage Mind. Uh, of course it was in French and so it was called something else. But uh, in English it's called The Savage Mind and uh, in there he distinguishes between uh, these two types of uh, thinkers or workers. Uh, one is the bricolier, uh, and the other is the engineer. And he's using both of these terms very broadly. So the bricolier is someone who uh, has a problem, looks at what resources they have, and then solves it. 
The engineer is someone who looks at a problem, thinks about how they're going to solve it, gathers together all of the resources that they're going to need and the skills that they're going to need, puts all that stuff together as a package, and then goes through and solves the problem. Do you understand the distinction? So one, there's a lot of planning in the engineer, planning on what resources you're going to need, what skills you're going to need. And then the bricolier is a lot of making use of uh, what materials are at hand and uh, in the skills that you already have uh, to do something. And, and part of the point is that uh, people really haven't changed much over time. That uh, in many ways, we're a reflection of the environment that we're in. So uh, the reason that we design stuff uh, now the way we do uh, versus the way things were designed 4,000 years ago uh, is we've just got different stuff at hand. Uh, and because we have those different things at hand, the, the result of our craft is a little bit different. Okay? So uh, I was trying to think of an easy way to explain this and uh, made me think of food. Uh, bricolage uh, is one area of my life where, uh, uh, or rather cooking is one area of my life where I incorporate a lot of bricolage. So this is brisket that I made. Notice the nice dark smoke ring. Those are good. Uh, right here, how many of you watched the Great British Baking Show? Okay. So uh, did you see the episode where they made the 20 layer uh, German cake? So uh, this is 20 layer German cake. Uh, things are a little complex when I bake in my house because my son uh, is allergic to eggs. And eggs are kind of fundamental to baking, right? And uh, so every time I make something, I can't follow the recipe. There's an element of bricolage. I have to take the materials at hand, the constraints that I've got, and try and solve that problem in a different way. And so even though there's a recipe for this cake, now, I can't use that recipe. I've got to come up with something different. This is a chocolate chip cookie. It doesn't have any eggs in it, and it was really good. This is something that I found in Pennsylvania. Uh, it is called a fatty. <laughs> and uh, it is everything that you would hope it would be. So you take bacon, and you weave it into a mat. And then you take sausage, and you roll it flat into a thing about the same size as that bacon, and you put it on top of there. And then you take potatoes and green peppers, and you would normally put egg. We can't do that. Some cheese, some seasoning and everything. You roll it all up like a big sushi roll. And uh, you put it in a plastic uh, in saran wrap, and you twist it up really tight so it gets good and tight. And then uh, you unwrap it, and you put it on your grill, and you smoke it for like three hours. And, uh, and it's every bit as amazing as you would think. This is a really cool uh, sandwich that I made. And it just, I just thought I would take a picture of it because it looked so good. <laughs> Sometimes you're just like, you know what? I think I need to take a picture of that. It's, uh, it was delightful. So uh, again, bricolage. So yes? I made that bread. So Tell me about it. So this is called tiger bread. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's kind of a cool bread. So you make, uh, you make the bread again without egg. You would normally use the egg. But it, uh, you take rice flour, and you mix it with a little bit of yeast and some vegetable oil. Mix that whole thing up, and then you brush it on top. And as the whole roll rises, uh, this starts to crack. And then when you put it in the oven, it rises more, cracks more, and you end up with this crackly, crunchy top uh, on top of this roll. It's amazing. And, uh, and then there's this really cool piece of bacon down here that's like this quarter-inch, really thick-cut bacon. And there's avocado. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff going on in that. But uh, so the materials that were at hand, uh, subject to the constraint that I can't uh, use egg in any of the things, uh, produced that sandwich. Okay. Any other question about the food? That's the good part. Some of you got food going right now. So you're like, yes. What was your substitute for egg in a chocolate chip cookie? That's a great question. So I, uh, I spend time when I start making something. I make, 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 make it. Uh, when I did eclairs, I spent like three months I, where I made eclairs every single night. Uh, and I would just make the pat of choux. The, in, the, the inside part is easy, but that outside part is really hard. And uh, so I would make a batch, of, like a mini batch of eclairs, and then I would throw it out. Make a mini batch, throw it out, feed them to the dog, whatever. I would just be making a few of them at a time because it was really hard. And then once I figured out how to do it, then I was done and it wasn't interesting anymore. So when I did chocolate chip cookies, uh, I made chocolate chip cookies every night for like six weeks. 
uh, just making these little mini batches of six chocolate chip cookies. And I finally found this is what you do with chocolate chip cookies. Uh, I use applesauce. So every egg weighs 50 grams. So I use the equivalent in grams of applesauce. And then I mix in a little bit of baking powder. And the combined effect uh, is such that I can replace the egg in my chocolate chip cookie. There you go. So each time I had to change the applesauce or banana or other kinds of things, how much baking powder, all that, until we got it right. All right, so there's this guy, uh, Tad Lesky. Has anybody heard of Tad Lesky? OK, what do you know about Tad Lesky? Uh, just the name? OK. So Tad Lesky was an architect. Uh, and I'm going to uh, have someone tell you a story about him. I've got a little two-minute video. And then at the end, I want you to answer the question, was he a bricklayer or was he an engineer? So he was an architect, uh, and he was working uh, for uh, the architectural firm uh, that managed uh, the creation of Lincoln Center in New York. Uh, have you guys been there? People been to Lincoln Center? A few? So the Metropolitan Opera is there, and then they've got this very famous opera house uh, that was designed, and he was helping to design that opera house. And uh, so here is a little video about that process. The chandeliers happen from an accident, which is one of the best ways to get out of your own way. That's something that you didn't intend. When something goes wrong, when something doesn't happen as you willfully wanted, it opens your mind to something that's right in front of you. One day, my father very characteristically is making a sketch, mixed media, grabbing anything that's in front of him, and not only of conceiving of a design, but then quickly visualizing it. So he's drawing it in order to communicate to others for a meeting. And in the process of adding some finishing touches with paint, a splat happened on his perspective. And there was no time to really start over again, because it was just before a meeting. All these paints splashed on the drawing and created some quite nice elements, but in the middle of the drawing, like fireworks, you know. My husband came and said, what did you do now? Rockefeller is waiting, Bimp is waiting, everyone is waiting. Gosh, what shall you do now? So he quickly added some lines so that splotch of white paint could be refracted light from the chandelier. My father was nervous about that because Rockefeller and Harrison both were thinking that they would get a traditional design for a chandelier, and this clearly was something else. And uh, when I brought this, look for a look, and big also, I said, well, it looks very nice. Uh, I said, that's what, but it isn't this white. Don't look at these white spots and so on. Look on the, mm -hmm. at the drawing behind me. And I said, no, no, we are talking about that. Is it possible to do something like that? Look at me. I said, yes, of course you could do something. There's a reason why everybody went, ah. Even though they had other intentions. My father's intention was not to splash across the page. Harrison's intention was to respect Rockefeller's intention, which was to do a traditional chandelier. But they all went, ah. There's something that is shared that's just in the air. And suddenly it started to assert itself as not just an accident, but as something that could be the, the beginning, the birth, the genesis of the design. Okay, and then uh, I've got just this little thing here. That doesn't show them very well. So here they are in, uh, on site.
So they also call those, incidentally, the Sputnik chandeliers. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, our architect friend, Tadaleski. Is he a bricklayer or is he an engineer? got an opinion on the matter. Yes. I would argue Bricolier for sure. I mean, he... Uh, okay. Why is that? It's not like he was going into the, okay, this opera house needs lighting. Let's, you know, maybe if we, okay, we're going to have to, like, you know, drop down electricity cords, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it'd be cool if it looked like this. It's just like suddenly something happened in the media representation that he was choosing to use. And, um... Well, also, deadlines for meetings are kind of helpful in that, <laughs> in that sense, and then, uh, Okay, yeah. so I'm going to write down two things. Uh, there was some accident, yeah. and then there was a deadline, uh, and those two, those two factors came together in some way uh, that tended towards bricolage. Anything else? Okay, other thoughts? I think a bit of both, um, because okay. when he was asked, oh, can you do something like this, he wasn't going in that direction, so he would he probably had to draw from different resources to like come up with, not the design, but actually like implementing his design, so. Okay. I'm writing over here on the other side, if I'm not sure, can you still make that out? Yes. Okay. So um, in the green side now, I'm saying intention. His intention was he had this plan that he was going to happen, and then and then, so he started out as an engineer, maybe, mm -hmm. and then an accident happened and pulled him to the other side. Is that what you're? Um, I was going more like when he was asked that if he could make something like that, like the chandeliers, he uh -huh. probably had to draw from like different resources and not come up with like what he had available, um, but actually implement like his design. So nice. there was a bit of engineering, I feel. So like. you're talking about the backside too. So he started out as an engineer, mm -hmm. an accident happened, but then he had to revert to being an engineer Probably to be able to execute this plan uh, that he had now said, oh yeah, sure. I love his <laughs> right, accent, right. sure. <laughs> There's actually a super cool video on YouTube where somebody is just interviewing him on the street. Uh, and they've got like their little ca cell phone camera going, and he's telling this story. You can't understand a thing. I was going to show you that one, but it's not subtitled. So, uh, but he's super cute at it. Okay, other thoughts? That pretty much captures it for everybody. Okay. Well, after the splash happened, he didn't think about um, doing things from scratch and you know thinking about new resources. He just, you know, had some resources available over there, just a brush and some paint, and he just thought about using those resources to, to solve the problem. So it's something on the Berkeleyer side, I think. Okay. So there's, and I don't even know how to write that, but there was something, that, and they, they show this, and obviously this is a dramatic re, uh, retelling of the story, right? But uh, he takes the paint that's there, and he's just kind of spreading out the thing that's there in a way that uh, those of us who are less artistically inclined wouldn't do, right? I would try and mop it up and smear stuff all over or something, right? I would make the matter worse. Okay, so uh, there's something about, well, we got the wrong color going. Something about our resources and how he solved the problem uh, just with what was immediately there that's definitely bricolage. Okay, any other thoughts or things you noticed? Okay. All right, I've got another example. Uh, how many of you have heard of this guy, Carlos Scarpa? Okay. So Carlos Scarpa is a, a Venetian architect, and uh, he had a job of, um, this is a, the convent of San Sebastiano, uh, and uh, his job was to convert this convent into uh, a new building for, uh, for his university that uh, they'd be able to use for, uh, to house, I can't remember which college, uh, arts and literature or something, house some sort of co uh, uh, college there. And uh, so he's an architect, he's got a whole bunch of uh, little baby architects working for him uh, in this firm working on this problem. And uh, while they are, uh, they've got this set of plans out, one of his junior architects uh, is carefully uh, tracing 
the kind of their base view. So uh, they, they didn't have giant copiers uh, to copy the plans. They did a lot of these tracings by hand. So they have the base one down, uh, and this architect has a, a sheet of paper over it and is tracing the lines along and doing it very meticulously and carefully, trying to get these lines exactly right. And uh, obviously, if you're doing that and you're trying to do a really good job, you need to be smoking. And uh, especially if you're an architect in Italy. So, uh, so we've got this Italian architect who's cruising along uh, and is trying to keep perfectly still as he's going across. And in the middle of that, the ash on his cigarette is building and building and building and finally falls and lands on the paper and burns a hole in it. And he's in a big panic. He doesn't know what to do. He's trying to clean stuff up, and he's, he's uh, worried he's going to have to do the whole thing over again. He's freaking out. And Scarpa comes up and says, we will have a tree here, and draws a circle around the burn uh, in the paper. And uh, in a little side note, he, names the, the, he specifies the tree that should be there, I wrote it down, as the Fagus rubra, uh, which is kind of a pun. So uh, at the time, in the 60s, uh, a cigarette in the UK was sometimes called a fag. And uh, so Fagus and rubra is red, so it's a red beach was what he specified, or the burning cigarette. Uh, and uh, that tree and every subsequent uh, version of the plans that came out, that tree was there and ultimately was in the, uh, the plan uh, for, that, uh, for that space. So uh, Carlos Scarpa, engineer or bricolier? What do you think? What does this have in common with the previous story? Accident. An accident. An accident. Okay, so a particular set of circumstances, uh, there's some sort of crisis, we've got a deadline too, uh, but uh, there's some sort of crisis and then he responds to it, and rather than kind of throwing everything away, he just says, all right, we're going to interact with this, okay? Uh, and so maybe there's an element of bricolage there. Any other things you notice about it? really contrary to most architects who are super type A and intense and perfectionist. <laughs> yeah, so we have this perception at least yeah. uh, that uh, they behave in a very particular direction, but this idea that they're just going to roll with it and say, and we will have a tree here. I love that. Draws a big circle around it and, and problem solved. Right? Okay. Yeah. I think the accident kind of triggers an idea like with the other story. Nice. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is an interesting thing. Uh, how many of you are a part of the, uh, the MS, MENG, the, uh, the engineering design program? Everybody? Right? So, uh, not everybody? I don't know. Which program are you talking about? The, the Masters in, in uh, design, science. design Science. Yeah, yeah. yeah program. Just, clear. Just about everybody? Okay, so have you gone through concept generation activities? Okay, I talked about those kinds of things. So concept generation, one of the fundamental kind of pieces of concept generation are idea triggers. Right? How does that work? What do you remember from your concept generation stuff? We've got brainstorming, but what else do we have? What other kinds of tools do we have? Deadlines. Um, Deadlines, <laughs> big one. They generate all sorts of uh, opportunity. What else? Designed by analogy, maybe? Okay, designed by analogy. That's perfect. So you've got some sort of, this is how this is solved in one way. Can we apply it over here? So we use that as an idea trigger. Okay, what else? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different ways to go through the design process. You kind of establish the problem in your mind. You go for a walk, and then you see it sort of solved elsewhere. Um, you can break it down into subcomponents and then try and then, you know, idealize them into different ways, and you're like, all right, how do we make these two mixed together? Right, how do we bring it all back? Yeah, and bio, bio mimicry is my personal favorite. Um, okay. Looking at nature for solutions. On how okay, so you go to nature and you say, how does nature solve this problem, and can we apply that uh, right here? You might do some sort of other external search where you're doing patent searches. Is there something, you know, how, have they solved this problem? There's a famous case uh, with, uh, with Dyson with their vacuum. Uh, where they had developed this cool way of doing a bagless vacuum, and Dyson went around and tried to get everybody, uh, these different vacuum manufacturers, to be on board with this idea, and uh, nobody wanted to, to buy it from him. 
And uh, so he ended up going off and starting his own company. Well, some of those people that he went and visited started to develop uh, technologies that were very similar. Uh, and they had to go out and, and find inspiration that wasn't him so that they could work around the patent uh, stuff. And so they, uh, there was a company that went, I think it was Eureka, went and looked at uh, how oil filtering uh, was done. When, you, when they're refining oil, how does that process happen? And uh, are they able to do it without filters and these other things? And they, they supposedly sought inspiration from there uh, to develop their bagless vacuum technology. Dyson, of course, then sued them and won. Uh, and, uh, but so these idea triggers, we look for external things to solve that problem and, and inspire stuff, okay? All right, here's another one. Uh, I live in Pennsylvania now, and uh, so uh, we spend a little bit of time with Frank Lloyd Wright. How many have heard of Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright? All right, how many have seen a Frank Lloyd Wright uh, house or building in person? Okay, what are the ones that you've seen? Falling water, I've just studied extensively, but there's one in Ann Arbor you can kind of drive. By. Yeah, good. Okay, there's one, I think, on off Gettys Road. Okay, what else? Falling water. Falling water? Others? What else have you seen in person? Yeah? Uh, a horrible building at UCI. <laughs> <laughs> there's some bad ones out there. <laughs> good. Uh, have you been to New York City and seen the museum, of, uh, not the Museum of Modern Art, the uh, Guggenheim? Yeah. Okay. okay. Good, so that's a good one. Uh, so, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. The falling water is in uh, Pennsylvania, just south of Pittsburgh, about an hour. And uh, the obvious uh, attraction, or one of the attractions to falling water, is that there's this waterfall that passes kind of through the house. And uh, there's, uh, this is a little plunge pool that uh, you can walk down to. The steps go into there, and the water kind of drifts around and goes off the edge. But there's more uh, to the house and how it is uh, in tune with the environment or considers the environment than just that waterfall. On the inside of the house, uh, there are great big boulders uh, that are intact uh, and incorporated into the house. And they're all polished and waxed up nice and uh, in a part of that uh, room. And then on the outside of the house, did you see this when you visited? Uh, so there are places where uh, the little, um, I just forgot what this is called. It's like an arbor, uh, but uh, the little uh, cross things that go across. What's the word? Veranda things. Yeah, it's a veranda. There's a thing. There's a thing. But there's this magic word. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Like a pergola. Yes, a pergola. Thank you. Uh, coming across, and there was a tree here, and they curved it around the tree, and it's actually one of the really fun things. Rather than just tearing the tree out, they uh, they responded to that. So, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, is he an engineer or is he a bricklayer? I think the engineers were rather upset with him in the building of this house. The engineers, there are a lot of things to be upset about. They've actually had to work on this house quite a bit. Uh, the cantilever stuff has caused some trouble. And these kinds of things right here uh, are a little bit maddening. Uh, the Hoffmans who commissioned the house were probably a little bit frustrated that it cost three or four times what it was supposed to. Uh, so there might have been some, uh, some problems there. Of course, their son uh, was one of Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, kind of apprentices. And uh, so he got, got caught in the middle of things often, and that complicated stuff. Okay, but what do you think? Bricolier? We don't, so. There's, uh, there's a little bit of a story about a deadline where he didn't have the plans ready, and, and the, the, Hoffman, uh, the Kaufmans were very frustrated and coming to visit. Their son was up in arms because he had this whole thing arranged, and then no work had been done, and Frank Lloyd Wright hurried and, and cranked out this drawing in the wrong place. Uh, he put it at the waterfall instead of back where they wanted it. So there's a little bit of a deadline story there, but uh, I don't know how that played in. What do you think? Okay. I think he's an engineer okay. because, at least from my understanding of like the uh, sequence of events, he probably went to the site and saw all of these things and then planned around them. It's not like they were building that beam and like, like oh, oops, there's this tree here that we didn't know, got to curve it. So I think because they like took nature into account before actually building, that he would be an engineer. Okay. So there's some sort of foresight involved. So he, he did do a reconnaissance, did a site visit. They, they mapped every tree and every rock in the whole big space. 
Uh, and they did that first. And so because he considered that in the process uh, and planned around those, we're saying that uh, that's an engineering feature. That seems likely. Hey, other thoughts? I know this is probably where you're, you're headed in general. I'm not sure where I'm headed. We'll find out. OK, great. Um, I don't, when possible, I like to try to go for more of a spectrum rather than the engineer or brick, bricklier. Okay. Uh, the idea that they're interwoven with one another. There are elements of both, like we've been kind of saying, but okay. they probably play off of each other in tiny ways that are difficult for us to perceive throughout the process. Okay. That's an interesting idea. I'm going to use a new color and uh, put something down here about, uh, so you used a phrase, playing off each other. Kind of a jazz thing going on where uh, they're moving back and forth between the two. Uh, each one responds to the other and uh, to tell whatever the, the useful story is. Okay, other thoughts? I think he's pretty clear because he uh, tried to make harmonious with the previous environment by making car. I think if he he is an engineer, he might just cut up the tree to make to be organized. Nice. Okay, so that's an interesting idea. So the harmony. So he responded to what was there and incorporated it into his design rather than just going in and putting down a cookie cutter house, you know, leveling out all the trees and sticking stuff in. So he, he had foresight, he knew where stuff was, but he considered it in his design uh, in maybe a, a, almost a respectful way. He was able to leave many things intact that preserve some harmony. So maybe to your point earlier that there is some of both happening right here. Okay, any other thoughts? Okay. All right, uh, so we've had a few architects. Uh, now I've got uh, some NASA engineers for us. And uh, how many of you watched the movie Apollo 13? Good, because I mean, there's only like three movies about engineers. And uh, so you've got to be well versed in all of them. Uh, all right, so we've got this guy right here. Do you know which scene I'm going to show you? Who knows what scene I'm going to show you? All right. Today we're PM. AM. Very, very AM. Dave is running a temperature and none of them has slept I since the explosion. I can't order these guys to go to sleep. Did you sleep up there? It's gonna get awful cold in there for those guys. Can you hear this? Gene, we have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We got a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb. Which are meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. You're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 when you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. And the ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. It just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs handed us this one, and we gotta come through. We gotta find a way to make this fit into the hole for this. We're using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. We're gonna get some coffee going too. Come along. All right. So we need to get this to fit into the whole design for this using nothing but that. What is that? That's bricolage, right? So that's there. In this particular case, this is maybe the purest form of, of uh, bricolage. They've got a finite set of resources. They're in space. Uh, the only thing that they have are what's inside of this, uh, these two little spacecraft uh, that are connected together. And they've got a big problem to solve, right? Uh, and in some ways, this has a lot of things. They've got an accident, uh, and they've got a deadline because people are going to die. Uh, they have a finite set of resources, and uh, they're then trying to go through and solve this problem. Do you remember how it works? What happens? 
all just like watch Apollo 13 after. <laughs> Uh, they come up with a way. What they, they do is they come up with this set of procedure. Uh, and it says, all right, you know, step one, tear the cover off of this manual. Step two, take the bag that these things came in, carefully remove the stuff out of it, and tape it to this part. Step three, and they've got these steps where they're taking all these weird little pieces of stuff and cobbling together this adapter that will allow these two uh, uh, portions of the craft to work together. Uh, so that's pretty pure bricolage. Does it have engineering elements to it? For sure. Okay. Yeah, there's like technical specifications that they're going to have to like, you know, uh, succeed in. Like it has to, a filter has to do a certain amount of stuff, has to seal. Okay, so there's engineering requirements. It's not just drawing a light and uh, saying, look, we've got this new Sput Sputnik chandelier. Right, so this actually has to work. It's got to meet some certain requirements. Other elements? They're having to invent new uh, functional uses of the components that they're working with beyond what they were originally intended for. So whereas just taking the pieces that you have as they are might be bricolage perhaps. Uh, engineering then says, we have these elements and they do these things. What else could they do? Okay. I. I think that uh, Levi Strauss would probably say that that's the, the very heart of bricolage, is taking what you have and using it in a new way. But uh, as engineers, certainly we feel like that's our job, uh, is to take, is to create in those kinds of ways. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy, uh, I guess. And one of the problems, we need another word uh, besides engineer to use here. Okay, any other thoughts? All right, so you guys are all, uh, everybody has a project uh, that you're working on, right? So I'm going to give you like three minutes uh, to think about uh, right now your practice, uh, how you're working on that problem, and to what degree you are behaving as an engineer, and to what degree you're behaving as a bricolier. Okay? So you can think about it individually, you can talk with your friends. I'm going to give you three minutes, one, two, three, go. Broadly speaking, uh, what are some ways, and actually before we do this, uh, John and I were just discussing earlier, uh, and maybe I didn't make this clear at the beginning, so I want to make it clear now. Uh, those words, the bricolier and engineer, those are the words that are translated from the French, and uh, when uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, chose those words, he wasn't thinking engineering, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, the word is engineer. Uh, because we have a, whole, a big association for engineers. In fact, uh, we're all engineers and, and uh, are certainly creative people who solve, do a lot of problem solving and everything else. He, he wasn't thinking about uh, engineer in that way. Uh, so uh, it's just it's an unfortunate happenstance that the word is the one that, uh, that we know and use uh, so affectionately. Uh, so when he's, when he's talking about engineer, uh, he's talking about this, uh, this notion that you have a clean sheet of paper uh, and starting from scratch, you work through solving a problem uh, and amass all those resources together and a plan and then execute those steps to solve it versus uh, coming into maybe a messier situation, looking what's available to you and applying that uh, to, to solve the problem. Okay? So we'll keep using his word engineer, but know that uh, it has very little to do, maybe, with uh, the, what we think of as engineering. Is that OK? All right, so uh, in your projects, what are some activities that you do that are engineer uh, activities? OK? Like a prototype. OK, so some, some of your prototyping activities. So uh, in what way is that an engineer activity? So you need to. Uh, you need to build something that fulfills the requirement of showing the functionality. So, um, I think that's kind of, you need some system um, thinking in that. So, okay. So depending on how that prototyping is done, I think it could be a very engineer activity, or it could actually be a great example of bricolage. If you're prototyping and uh, someone comes and says, here's your prototyping kit, and uh, like this, they say, here's your prototyping kit. And they dump it on the table. And then they say, all right, make your prototype. 
uh, that would definitely be a very bricolier activity versus if you're starting from a clean sheet of paper and you say, all right, what are all the things I'm going to need to make this prototype and work through and execute that plan? Okay, good. What else? Other engineer, yeah. I was just going to say what you did. We thought it was like the bricolier section. Like for our alpha prototype, we just had like uh, a, brick, a cart back there of stuff and we just like took some things and articulated our idea okay. across. So we put it in prototyping. Maybe um, our beta prototype is a little bit more on the engineering side because we have more functionality that we want to display. So, And then also we're not just like taking 20 minutes to do it. We're putting in more thought into it. Good. So okay. So that goes actually to a couple of things that we've talked about and maybe this notion of bouncing back and forth. All right, so very early on, you might be acting as a bricolier, but as it, the process develops, you might behave more in an engineer way. Uh, and there are some other things, you know, if you've got a cart at the back of the room and 20 minutes to make a, a, a first prototype, uh, that behavior is certainly very different than, all right, you've got $1,000 in a month to make your next prototype. You probably don't have $1,000, but. Uh, <laughs> good, all right, other things you saw. Yeah. Is it me or? Sure, either one. Okay. We'll get the um, other one on the next one. Yeah, so we, um, we're doing a project with bikes, and bike parts are really expensive. And so we went looking for bike frames and what parts we could kind of save from those like entire bikes that we could use in our prototype, actually. Perfect. So it could be a little bit of both, because we're using like what we have accessible and what we could find in a donation. Um, but also then, we're buying what we're missing from okay. that. So I think pulling from both nice. sides. So you're doing some planning. You're going out and amassing a whole bunch of, but you're going out and saying, all right, what can we get for cheap or free? And using that to create your we pool use. of resources to come from. Mm -hmm. Nice. OK, go ahead. I was just going to say that I, I think of engineering as kind of like a bottom-up data-driven approach, a method where you're, you're well, I'm going to have to think about that for a second. I need like five seconds. <laughs> bottom-up, data-driven. So first of all, it's two hyphened words. So a bottom-up, data-driven approach. Got it. Go. Okay. So uh, you're, you're, you have all these algorithms, and you're trying to optimize something based on um, re really not really constricting it to uh, the materials that you have, but you're, you're more eliminating, you're, you're constricting it to um, what you want to do with the product, whereas with um, uh, bricolage, I, I think it's more of a top-down. Um, kind of knowledge driven, figuring out what you have uh, at your disposal and putting something together from there. Nice. Okay. That's a, a fun way of thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, I'd like you. to bounce off that because something I've been wrestling around in my head is kind of the two terms like <laughs> you both you're, you're making something, right? Trying to solve a problem. But one is like you're making do versus making right. So in engineering, I see you're trying to make it right. Well, in you know, brick lodge, you're making do, right? With what you have, your limited resources. And then the idea of like validation versus verification. On the bricolage, you more care about, you know, did you do the right thing, not if you did it right. So you more care about the validation versus verification where the engineers care about the verification. Okay. Nice. That's interesting. I, uh, um, I'm going to push back a teeny bit on one part of this and ask the question. Uh, the chandeliers that we saw uh, in, uh, the, at the beginning, the Metropolitan uh, Opera, was that making do or was that making right? right? What do you think? How many people say that we settled for the chandeliers and we could have had something better? And how many people say, so you've got to vote. So the choices are settled on the chandeliers. We could add something better. How many people say that was brilliant? We are so lucky we got those. OK, so make and do. OK, how many people, that's brilliant. We're so lucky we got those. That's interesting. I think you have to consider like what the purpose of a chandelier is from an engineering standpoint is to give is to provide light. I'm not sure that those are those chandeliers are probably the most efficient at doing that or, uh, doing that task. So you're saying that the chandeliers in the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City, so maybe one of the most culturally significant buildings in the country should just provide light. No, no, and I'm not saying that. I, I, I'm saying that it could be a combination of both, but one of the primary reasons is to provide light. Okay. 
I would say, what are, well, what are some other thoughts? So we were about 60-40 maybe, which blew my mind. Okay, go ahead. So what are some, what's the, what are other thoughts? For like UD purpose more than like for a functional purpose because it looks good, it's in New York, so it's right, but it's not engineeringly right, I think. This is so fantastic. <laughs> uh, you guys are just blowing my mind right now. All right, so this is a form function debate at its heart, right? Okay, so what were you going to say? I was going to say, like, the question is, okay, were they planning on having a chandelier in the first place? And they just, they, they, instead of being able to have this conversation about like, oh, okay, like what kind of chandelier are we going to use? You know, what are we going to invoke? They just kind of by accident had this like, oh, hey, that's kind of a cool Sputnik-ish idea for a chandelier. And then they settled on that without even having to have a long conversation about it. So I think, and maybe I should go back to them. Maybe it's like they were just making, making do with what was the first cool inspiration. I don't know. Okay. This is brilliant. Yes. So I think if we just started thinking about all the, you know, planning and uh, engineering functionality, probably we wouldn't come up with that idea. So uh, uh, the fact that uh, he came up with that idea is because of that accident and that triggered an idea, right? So I think it's not just making it do, but it's making it right by accident. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, I'm more on the, uh, we're lucky that we had that idea. It's not just making it do it does more than just because somebody could could just put a light over there and it would do but with with, with the new idea it just does it really good you okay know? so uh if we if if things had gone according to plan we would have ended up with a great solution and instead we had a happy accident and got something that was Maybe as good and perhaps even a little better. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Okay. I guess conceptually my question is, what is bricolage not? Like, it seems like bricolage right now is spanning this whole gamut from like idea to generation to creation to accident. But when does something stop being bricolage and turns into something else? And even with all these ideas, like you can't accidentally determine that that chandelier needs 240 volts power or whatever case may be so maybe there is like this flash of insight where bricolage occurs but then you transfer from that to the execution and that's where bricolage stops and maybe it comes back in based on shortage of resources or whatever case may be yeah i think that's actually pretty fair in many respects um so I'm going to tell you a fast story. Uh, I got to Penn State, and first of all, as you may have suspected, I love this stuff. Uh, I love design in general. I love uh, engineering design in particular. Uh, and uh, I just I think it's super cool. And so when I got to, to Penn State, uh, I started hanging out with like-minded people, as will happen. Uh, and uh, I met a young uh, faculty member from architecture, and we started talking about a course that we could teach together. Uh, where we would teach students uh, design, we'd bring the kind of the engineering perspective, the architecture perspective, and we'd have students, maybe 10 students from each uh, discipline, mix them all up and it would be a lot of fun. We spent three or four years planning this course. And uh, we finally got the stars aligned and we were able to teach it. And we got into class on the first day and realized that we had been talking about some fundamental aspects of class like studio in very, very different ways. So to him, uh, studio was holy time. It was sacred time where the faculty should not interfere. The students should be able to do whatever they want and work on their projects during studio. In my mind, uh, studio was a time where uh, students would work under kind of structured supervision. Uh, I would give them an objective. They would work on it. I would respond. They'd work on stuff some more. So I. Uh, I envisioned maybe a lot more direction and hand-holding than he did. Uh, and so that was the first thing that happened. The next thing that happened is uh, he would stand up and he would uh, teach by telling stories. Uh, here is the story of falling water. Here is the story of you know, this great design or that great design. And each time he would tell the story, it would be illustrating some point, usually built around concept generation. Here is how the ideas uh, came about to create falling water. 
Here's how the ideas came about to create this thing. It was in response to this other thing, and it added this piece over here, and it was inspired by this. And every time he would do that, I would say, raise my hand, I would say, we have that in engineering. Uh, we call that the 635 method. Uh, and he would do something else. We have that in engineering. We call that biomimicry. And what we found is that for every story, uh, I had a recipe. And we realized that that is one of the things that engineers have done. Uh, we like repeatability. If you have a lot of success with something a few times, why not have success with that all the time? Right? And so we make this recipe uh, a design process, if you will, to help ensure that we have predictable quality come out. And uh, so we have, within concept generation, we have a whole bunch of different ways to concept generate. Uh, and we use these, deploy these recipes, uh, versus the architects who kind of have them just flowing within them. I don't know. They feel a little bit sullied once you say that the, it has a name. Every time I told him it had a name, he felt just a little bit dirtier uh, and, and didn't like that at all. But in, and so I tell you that story quickly, uh, over five minutes, uh, because I, I think your point is an interesting one. Uh, when does one become the other? And, and I think in some ways it might become the other when you give it a name uh, and when you turn it into a recipe. Uh, when it stops being uh, kind of this broader thing uh, where it's just kind of big picture problem solving, this savage mind, the resources at hand, and we need to solve this problem, and starts to become, can we predict success uh, by doing this specific set of things? As soon as we give it that structure, then maybe it's a little less bricolage. Uh, but then there are those moments where you jump out of the structure, like we saw with the chandeliers. There was a method he was supposed to be following. Something happened that tore him out of that process, and something magical happened. Okay, yeah. In many ways, this captures the debate or the struggle that I, I hear between design as a discipline itself. Mm -hmm. So like we, we have a design department on campus, which has nothing to do with design science functionally on a day-to-day -day basis. And then there's the engineering design world. And they're separate from one another. They almost don't interact. When I listen to podcasts on design, they, they talk about engineering and algorithms as though they're the devil. Um, but then <laughs> yes. vice versa happens in the world of engineering. We poo-poo what they do. Exactly. There's no rigor. And so it's almost that we have this juxtaposition of these two ideas, blank slate versus constraint-based. Uh, and the two, like I said before, they're not separate. They shouldn't be separate. There are, there are ways in which they play off of each other constantly. But it's kind of an embodiment of that debate. I, uh, I think that that is a great observation. And we see the same thing in some respects at Penn State. We don't have an industrial design program. Uh, it, most of our stuff is built around architecture. And so it's a little bit more straightforward for how our interactions go. But uh, uh, yeah, it's a, a difficult challenge at every institution and more broadly in the, in the community. Yeah. What about the, how, how does this notion of agency play into this? I mean, in one setting, I might feel empowered. Like the, the junior architect doesn't feel empowered to say this is going to be a tree, but the person who's responsible for it and can make that decision says, oh, it's going to be a tree, versus if I'm in industry and I don't have that level of autonomy, I might not feel like I have the ability to make that decision or make do. i got to fix the problem to the department. That is a great uh, observation, and one as useful now as maybe 10 years from now when you're in charge. Uh, because you certainly want, uh, you want your junior architects uh, to feel empowered, uh, but you also don't want them to do silly things. Uh, and trying to find that balance is really difficult. Every cigarette burn can't be a tree. Every ink splotch can't be a chandelier. Somehow you need to be able to distinguish between the good uh, accidents and the bad ones. Uh, and that's a difficult challenge. Uh, and you know, it goes to the point earlier about, uh, where was it, somewhere in here, uh, about uh, the, you know, applying data and assessing and, and trying to quantify and predict success. Um, but yeah, it's a challenge. Okay, I'm going to tell you uh, a quick story. This is not uh, an architect's story. This is mine and actually uh, Matt Reed's story. 
and see if you can find some opportunities of uh, bricolage. And, uh, and there's also a little bit of engineering here, too. And uh, it's the chair story. And uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about myself uh, to begin with, so you'll know a little bit more about me. Uh, I started out, uh, one of the first research projects that I did as an undergraduate was in an area called compliant mechanisms. How many have heard of compliant mechanism? Yeah. So compliant mechanisms, the basic idea is that you take a rigid body uh, linkage. So this is a, a standard four bar linkage. There's some in this room. Uh, it's one of the fundamental kinematic building blocks. And you replace these rigid joints and these pins with flexible members, things that bend. And there are a lot of advantages to doing that. You can reduce part count. Uh, there's assembly, obviously, is not a big issue. There's some complications with that. But there's a lot of neat things that can happen. And I did some of my first work with compliant mechanisms. Then I did some stuff with MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. OK, how many have heard of MEMS? A few more? OK. So the basic idea here is that we're going to use the same fabrication techniques you use to make computer chips to make little teeny mechanisms. Uh, this is a dust mite. It's cruising around right here on a gear train. Uh, and we took uh, some work that I had done with compliant mechanisms and made it little teeny small. Uh, so this is a, a compliant bistable switch. Uh, so uh, it has two stable positions. And notice there are no pin joints in here. Uh, it's able to, we're taking polysilicon glass, essentially, and we're snapping it back and forth between uh, these two stable spots. And that was a, a cool little project that I worked on. For my master's thesis, uh, I did work in product development processes. And specifically, I was looking at, all right, how do you take a product development process and do you, how do you parameterize it? Break it into its kind of tinker toy chunks so you can assemble them together in lots of different ways and make uh, predictable, uh, successful outcomes. Uh, I got to Michigan and uh, started doing some work with the biomedical engineering department. We worked on uh, custom contoured seating cushions. Uh, so I had done some previous work with manufacturing and cutting of uh, kind of large surfaces that were contoured. And so I said, hey, what if we could laser scan somebody's butt and then uh, use that laser scan to custom contour a seat cushion uh, so you could build it really quickly rather than over a long period of time. That was a fun project. I worked with Panos, uh, who you guys know, on product platforming. So uh, and you know a little bit about platforming. Uh, how do we take uh, you know, something designed for uh, one market and then another product designed for a second market? How can we combine many of those elements uh, to make it less expensive to produce? So if you are a, uh, an automotive manufacturer, if you can make Lexus, uh, and you can make uh, Toyota, and you can have 80% of the parts of a Camry be the same as the parts of the fancy Lexus, and that saves you a bunch of money, right? So that's product platforming. I did some stuff in mass customization for people. I grew up working in a ski and bike shop. Uh, I started working at REI when I was 11 years old. It was child labor laws. And, uh, but I'd been doing optimization stuff, and I had a lot of experience with bikes, so I was saying, how can we figure out how much adjustability and how many sizes do we need so that we can make stuff so that uh, it works well for a lot of different people. Uh, I was working on my PhD looking at excursion capability, so more butt mapping and how people were moving their centers of pressure around. We were looking at pelvis. And uh, while I was working on this, uh, I had a wife and several kids. And I uh, was on a graduate student's salary. And uh, Matt Reed knew that uh, I was needy. And, uh, and also that I really enjoyed learning about lots of stuff. And so a company that he had worked with, Herman Miller, uh, needed somebody to help doing work on literature reviews. And so he suggested that I might be a good person for that. So I started doing some work for Herman Miller. Uh, and I was doing literature reviews. I was reading about different topics as much as I could, writing it all up and providing it to them. And, uh, but really, what I wanted to do was design chairs uh, and stuff. Herman Miller, if you know uh, the kind of the furniture thing very, at all, uh, very well at all, that's a big deal. Ray and Charles Eames, remember back to the beginning, my design icons? That's who they designed for. Uh, and so they made the Aaron, uh, which there's a tall version of right here. This is kind of the iconic chair of the uh, dot-com boom. In its prime, they were selling 20,000 of these a week. Uh, and it's revolutionary in a lot of ways that we can talk about later. 
Uh, they did uh, one of my favorite all-time chairs, the Eames Plywood Lounge. Uh, there's an Eames Plywood Dining Chair uh, that's a little more upright version of this uh, that I have as the dining chair in my home. My wife and I saved our money for 17 years uh, so that we could buy these. We used patio furniture for the first 17 years we were married uh, until we could finally get a set of uh, Eames chairs to go around our kitchen table. Uh, I love these. Uh, they make the Eames Lounge, which is an iconic chair. And uh, so Herman Miller, I really wanted to get involved with this kind of stuff. And there's some other uh, work that they had done. And I, you know, I was noodling around about all these different kinds of experiences that I had, all these things that I knew how to do. At the same time I was working on that, oh, Matt Reed uh, <laughs> was, uh, was also working on stuff. And uh, so uh, he had done a whole bunch of work for Herman Miller. Uh, it's hard to see right here, but there's actually a pressure mat back here. And uh, you traveled around to conferences, right? And had people. During the Aaron Walk. Yeah, so tell us about that fast. Oh, well, so uh, this, this uh, material, this sort of screen material of the Aaron chair was so innovative. It's called Pellicle. It's, a, it's got all kinds of patents around the, around the structure of this. But one of the things that was completely new about it is that the pressure distribution that it produces when you sit on it, very different from what you would get sitting on foam. So as part of the, um, the launch of this chair, uh, we were, I was working with them and we were going around to trade shows using the pressure distribution to show people this very big difference in the interface between the person and the chair. So that was, uh, yeah, in the 1870s, I think. So yeah, roughly the 1870s. <laughs> so Matt Reed had even more experience looking at butts than I did. And, uh, and in particular, looking at the pressure distributions that resulted. And so he knew that uh, there was an opportunity to create a really unique seating experience that would be uh, what an ideal chair would provide. And uh, so essentially what it would do is take the, the local uh, kind of bendy of the chair. Uh, so when you sit down on a chair, you've got those two big bony parts, your ischial tuberosities. Those things need to be supported in a very different way than the rest of the tissue. And the way you know that, if you reach down and you pinch your butt like right in the middle uh, versus pinch right under your thigh, now those two experiences are very different. Uh, one of them hurts a lot and the other maybe not so much. And so the, we, we know that we need that pressure distribution to be a little bit different. So we had this idea as we started talking about things. I really wanted to design a chair. And uh, he had some really cool ideas about it. So we came up with this idea we called bi-compliant. So we said, how can we design a chair that is bi-compliant? And uh, this is the first CAD model that I made of this. And the idea that we had was that there would be these little nubs. And these nubs would bend, uh, would flex up and down, and would be able to accommodate like your little ischial tuberosities. And that would handle the local compliance. And then there would be this big, thing right here that would kind of dish and would provide the global compliance, would take the overall shape uh, of your butt. And uh, so this was the very first CAD model we made. Once we had a CAD model, uh, we started making physical prototypes. Now, they can be expensive, so we started with little small ones. Uh, and uh, so this was my daughter. We needed small butts. Uh, I can't remember if we took her diaper off or not, so it, there may have been some uh, different contour experience, but even, even this small one right here was actually pretty hard. So you can kind of see these little nubs right here. Uh, there were 40 of those nubs. It's only four deep and 10 across, but 40 nubs is a lot of, a lot of drilling uh, to make even this little small prototype that's propped up on corn and bean cans. Okay, and uh, but we had good practice. Uh, we recruited a lot of different participants. So uh, this is <laughs> Matt was just looking at senior pictures. Yeah. So this is his oldest daughter. Uh, and you can see here, we've got the nice global compliance across here. And uh, here's another view. Uh, this is my older daughter. You can see the, the global compliance across here. You can see these little nubs kind of supporting along the way. From underneath, uh, this shows, so those nubs, we cut out a hole and it's, hard to see old digital cameras and such. 
But uh, these nubs, the idea was that they would push through this level of uh, layer of neoprene on top and press down through these holes. And that would give that local compliance. Well, once we started to get the idea, uh, we went to bigger ones. And uh, so you can see now, this is serious. This is 225 holes that we had to drill in this thing. And uh, we took an existing design to make stuff easier for us. So this is uh, an Aaron that uh, we cannibalized. So we replaced its pan with this one. You can see underneath there's that layer that we've drilled all out. And then there's this layer of silicone on, to uh, on top of it. Uh, and the idea is we're going to put nubs on this that will then press through each of those little holes. So the big one is going to give the global compliance. These little teeny holes are going to provide the local compliance. So uh, this is what, uh, here the nubs are all in place. And then we started working on the back. And we took this idea to Herman Miller, and uh, they patented it. And uh, you can see uh, it got some subsequent refinement and stuff. But here's uh, me and Matt Reed, Jeff Weber, who is kind of the main designer on the chair, and several Herman Miller employees and some others. Uh, I put this slide in here, but we can just skip over it. Uh, this is what I did with my money. I bought Apple stock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, then they continued to refine the design. So you saw the limited resources we had, right? But once we got to Herman Miller and they could bring real resources to the problem, uh, then they started building a lot bigger and, and better prototypes. Here's a pretty cool uh, little kind of lattice structure much better version of that thing that we talked about, right? You can see uh, it's all injection molded and got cool pieces through. But the same fundamental idea of these little cells that are deflecting down through. Uh, so Matt and I, I think, had a, a pretty big hand in the functional technology uh, behind it. Uh, not so much the look of the chair. Uh, that was left to, to Jeff Weber. And I think it's fantastic. But uh, it also, I think, belongs on the bridge of the a new Star Trek. Uh, so uh, this is the chair that resulted. <laughs> and when it came out, uh, it was phenomenally well reviewed. Uh, so they say, uh, the best chair we've ever sat on. And here's some pictures. You can see kind of from underneath and the back. And uh, we've got it right here. So this is the chair that we designed, or had a hand in designing. And uh, you can test it out after. I'm going to show you a couple things right here. So this is the seat pan uh, without the upholstery on it. And uh, you can see that a lot of these uh, concepts are still intact. So the individual nubs that handle the, lo uh, the local deflection of your ischial tuberosity. So you can sit on this in a lot of different orientations. It will handle that. Down towards the front, this is a cool idea. Uh, it kind of it rolls off the front. Uh, they're not worried about you perching on it so much. So this is the area that will mostly be under your thighs. Underneath, these provide that uh, global deflection, right? So these individual bands come across, and they deflect all the way across. And then within them, you can see each of these cells kind of deflects down. So I've got that. and. We can, I don't know, I can pass it around, or you can come take a look at it after. Here's the back. We had a little bit less to do with the back. Uh, one thing I think is uh, it's got a lot of those same uh, concepts that we had looked at. The, the cells are bigger. Uh, one thing that I think is cool is this. What does that look like? What's that? H. Yeah, so we've got a big H here. What about these little things? There's some tessellated structure through here. Mm -hmm that was inspired by something. Speaking of idea triggers. So they needed something. Your back doesn't have little tiny prominences like your butt does. It's, the features are a lot bigger. They needed something that would stay in contact with your back regardless of how that contour changed and regardless of how you moved around in it that was dynamic. So it would provide nice support there. Can you think of another structure that uh, has changing curvature and has something that needs to stay in contact with it all the time. Windshield wiper. So these are tessellated windshield wipers. 
So uh, then my question is, this chair, uh, I think, uh, is an interesting example of what we've been talking about. Would this chair be different if I was different? Or if Matt Reed was different, or Jeff Weber, who designed, kind of had the overall concept and did most of the, the big design work on it. What do you think? Yeah. I think yes. Um, you guys are kind of skinny. So <laughs> you like never have this problem of the, the arm. So like people who might be bigger or like want to sit differently okay. like, are restricted by an arm, but you guys have the arms. Okay, we tried. It goes pretty wide. No, but you're right. We certainly experience stuff the way that we experience things, and that affects our perception of stuff. Uh, and if we were a lot larger than we were, certainly I'm really tall, and so I assess everything I get into. Of, Does this work for tall people, right? Uh, but I am also really skinny, uh, and so if I were wider, that would change my perception of things and may have an effect on the resulting chair. What else? Yeah. Um, I think the uh, working environment plays a background. Like if you were in the Navy and you worked on a nuclear ship where you have to deal with like uh, salt water and things of that nature, corrosion, that might play a role. Or if you work, you know, a very arid environment where you have, you know, sand coming and blowing and stuff, like those things might play a consideration yeah. in the features. Sure. Uh, it, it, it might affect our, how robust we make things and what uh, considerations we might have for it. Good. What else? Yeah. It also seems like that, to me, I look at that and it looks like an office chair. Okay. Um, so you guys all being professionals, maybe engineers, all likely have some kind of desk job. Um, if you were like, I just really want to play video games and I want the chair that's going to like... Be the video game chair. Be the chair that I can just sit in for like eight days straight and like never have to play. <laughs> like that would look a lot... It too. might be a little different. It's like it might be super comfortable, but it still looks like I'm going to like get work done in that chair, not like... Okay. Nice. Yeah. Also, I think you talked about earlier that first prototype, you were combining all your experiences. Like, how could you come up with, like, something where you could use all those experiences and design something for this particular firm? So I think that, inf that probably influenced a lot, so. Yeah, it surely did. In fact, uh, do you see any pin joints? This is a mechanism. There are no rigid joints in this. There's no pin joints in this. It's a giant, in fact, maybe one of the most complex compliant mechanisms ever made. Uh, it's a, it's a absolutely 100% influenced by that. Okay, yeah? Um, kind of pulling off of your background, um, like if you were, if you're coming from like a sustainability background or environmental engineering, then that would influence what materials you choose. Good. Yeah, that's a great example. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I think also just when you're designing something, there's no way to do it objectively. And so like everything that you do is going to be clouded through whatever lens of like experiences and knowledge that you have, because that's how you like approach a problem. Perfect. And so that's the answer to this next question. What does this have to do with graduate school? Okay. Uh, you guys are going through graduate school. Uh, when you finish and you become productive citizens again, uh, once you leave academia, uh, as I will continue to be a non-productive. But as you guys go out and start doing good, uh, everything that you do, do you see that everything you do, whether you are an engineer or whether you are a bricolier, that each one of those uh, designs that you produce, every activity will be a result of the cumulative experiences you've had. Okay, so this chair is different because of the set of experiences that I had. Uh, and surely you can think of the projects that you've worked on and how you've brought your uh, tendency towards environmentally uh, or sustainability or experience in the military or uh, experience working in harsh environments or problems that uh, uh, you had working on this thing or when you were growing up a lack of resources or whatever. Each of us brings this set of experiences that we have, a toolbox to the problems that we solve. And so, my question is, therefore what? Okay. So therefore what? Uh, as you guys are uh, kind of charting your course through graduate school, uh, what are your important takeaways? What are the things that you need to uh, have in mind? I 
I'm not sure right now, so I just <laughs> keep a journal. Um, and kind of, I like going back to places where I don't have like a clear direction and see if it makes sense with like where I'm at in that that particular moment where I'm reading. So I don't know if that's that's different brilliant. Uh, that's a fantastic idea. Journals actually can be really helpful uh, for helping you for providing inspiration and helping you understand kind of past lives. Uh, really, that's a great one. What else? Yeah. So I have a tendency to be unimpressed with the things I know and to assume that other people know them. And so there's this, I have really good mentors who always remind me, Grace, you're looking at it from within your bubble. That's way more interesting than you think it is because yes, to you and the eight people you interact with daily, we all are familiar with this topic, but for the 1.5 million people outside of your bubble, they don't know this. So it's just to keep that perspective that you, you bring all these things to the table and that that's your, that's your bubble and sometimes your bubble seems really unimportant. <laughs> yeah, but it is. That, that cumulative set of experiences is, is super important and it's hard to have the confidence sometimes to recognize that and know. And that's part of, of my purpose is this. Uh, go forth and be awesome. Uh, these experiences that you collect you don't know what the valuable experience will be. When I was screwing around working on compliant mechanisms, I, it wasn't my research area. I was doing it so I could hang out with some friends. Uh, but it ended up being part of what made this chair what it was. There was no way for me to know that that was the essential uh, component. So as you're having these experiences, first of all, make sure you have them. Right? It's so easy. There's so much to do that uh, sometimes you get your head down and, and you forget to have the experience. Uh, you are at one of the best learning institutions in the world. The opportunities that you have here to learn, uh, not just within this track but outside of it, are phenomenal. Make sure you take advantage of those because you never know when you're getting the tool that is going to bring the astronauts home. Uh, or is going to create this beautiful thing that people from around the world get to come see, or that will help to make this chair that uh, video gamers can sit in for a long time, uh, or whatever it is. Uh, you never know when you're going to have that experience. Okay, yeah. Um, I would say to make sure that you try to incorporate your interest into some of the things you do. Like the grad school, more so than undergrad, gives you the flexibility to pursue the things that you're interested in. And ultimately, they will, like you said, drive to some of the design decisions that you end up making, as well as how you design your life. So view grad school as not something that is forced upon you or happens to you. It's something that you actively get to participate in and make it your own. That is fantastic advice. And uh, one of the important principles of architecture is that often the exact opposite advice is also good. Uh, and so, yes, 100%, pursue your interests and make sure you're doing things that are exciting and engaging to you. And every once in a while, order off menu. Try something that is completely different and not something that interests you. Uh, because you need to, uh, to supplement those things as well. Okay. Any last important uh, words? Go ahead. As a child that you particularly loved, oh, was there something about furniture design? <laughs> that is a super interesting question. Um, uh, maybe you had like a really bad experience in a chair. <laughs> 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 like, maybe I should lie down on the couch for a moment. Uh, <laughs> maybe <it's the> <laughs> or like a really good conversation. So they say. One of the, they say that every architect has one good chair in them. Uh, and maybe I heard that a few times. Uh, I'm not sure why I had that affinity. I think I found Ray and Charles Eames first uh, and just admired them. Uh, I, there was something about a husband-wife design team that I found very compelling. And, uh, and I thought that was super cool. And uh, I just really admired their work, and I think that pulled me towards chairs. Okay. All right. So uh, I know it's time to go, but uh, I would encourage you to uh, spend just a few minutes reflecting on your own experience and think, uh, all right, uh, to what degree have I been a bricklayer? 
To what degree have I been an engineer and do I need to balance myself a little bit more in one place or the other? Uh, I think often, as was pointed out, in undergrad, we're mostly engineers. We're coming along, we're marching down a path that has been set for us. Graduate school is a fantastic opportunity to maybe do a little bit of the bricolage. Uh, to look around, to find other opportunities, and to supplement our education experience and start to round out uh, our, our toolbox of, of capabilities and to put some really cool things in there. Uh, I am counting on you guys. I'm in academia. Uh, my impact on the world is mostly through you. Uh, and so the cool stuff that's going to happen, the people who are going to solve the really cool problems, it's you guys uh, coming up with the cool ideas, applying stuff in new ways, pulling these cool things out of this experience you're having at Michigan and the other things that you've done, and, and just really doing some neat stuff. Uh, you guys are the ones that are going to make the world a better place. And uh, so please do that. Uh, it's important to me that you do. So thanks for letting me come and be with you. Thank mm -hmm. you.